Hello and welcome to the very first Flip the Board video. My name is Liam Vincent Cobride and I am the bushy bearded Scott here to tell you all about board games. And what better way for us to begin than me giving you some pointers to start your very first collection. And let's face it, seeing as we're currently living in season six of Black Mirror, it's probably a better way to entertain yourself than dyeing your hair badly for the third time. Hey! <clears throat> The world of board games is, well, bigger than ever. We have a thriving community of gamers, reviewers, artists, playtesters, and even yearly conventions. We're seeing games with absolutely beautiful artwork. We have legacy games that can span days, even months, and sometimes years. We even have games with streamlined rules that mean you aren't staring into a manual every time it's your turn. Oh, that's right, board games are not just there to ruin family gatherings. For me, collecting board games happened, well, rather naturally. I was into art as a kid and gravitated towards miniature gaming because, well, I already loved painting for hours, so no real change there. But I think my real love for board games came when my best friend's dad introduced us to Dungeons & Dragons. Suddenly I was aware of how in-depth and exciting board games could be. And funnily enough, that exact same best friend started my gaming collection when he got me a Finnish edition of Risk. And it still holds pride of place in my collection today. So, that's just me. What about you? And while there was no real, well, right answer, I hope to put you in the right direction before you part with those precious pennies. Ooh, and I am going to be reviewing every single one of these games and teaching you the rules in the coming weeks. So if you like what you see, hit that subscribe button so you don't miss a thing. Right, let's get on with this. Let me say something pretty quickly. Board games can be, not always, but can be pretty expensive. Normally, the bigger the box means more components, which means more bits of plastic. And that means you're gonna be separated with much more of your hard earned dosh. And if you ever see the word miniature game, you're not really just buying a game you're actually making an early investment in becoming a collector of the numerous releases that are going to be coming out over the year. Yeah, but how cool is that? Yeah, okay. It is also very, very easy to be tempted by these big, beautiful, sexy, plastic-filled behemoths that you find on Kickstarter. And these often have sales pitches that will make them seem like they are the only game you'll ever need. And to be honest, you are going to be parting with a lot, possibly even hundreds, before this game ever arrives at your door. Please don't tell my wife. We often say you get what you pay for. And while these big, huge, expensive games can be utterly brilliant, these inexpensive games that will barely put a dent in your wallet can leave just as much as an impact. For example, take Love Letter and The Mind, both fantastic little games that I bring out all the time for warm-ups on game nights and have even taken to work to play on breaks. To this day, I have yet to hear any bad words about these games from friends and I purchased both for around £10 each. Getting the tiniest bit more expensive, around the 20 quid mark, are some other greats. Codenames, which is a fantastic party game for two to, well, really as many as you like. Karen, which is a chess checkers hybrid, if you played chess with magical shamans claiming land and building enchanted monoliths, altering the game board forever. And Scurvy Dice, which will see you battling for gorgeous custom treasure dice while you swear at your opponents for blasting holes through your hull for the time. And if you spend that little bit more, you might find slightly bigger, more complex games with more replayability. 
but we'll come to that in just a bit. Do you have a 6x4 gaming table? Or are you going to be gaming on a much smaller coffee table? Do you have storage? Or is your storage solution a bookcase that's already serving its purpose as your personal library? Personally, I adore miniature games. But I have to accept that with every new purchase, I am losing storage space. And because I am just such a huge geek, I can't just have the miniatures. I need terrain. <laughs> and this is just a very small amount of what I have and have built. <laughs> Look, if you have a huge playing space like this, then go wild. If you fancy the look of Gloomhaven, dive right in because it is brilliant. And if Legion takes your fancy, then honestly, this might be one of the best miniature games I've ever played. Sometimes it's not just a huge game board that you need space for, but for a seemingly uncomplicated game like Quacks of Quedlinburg, without enough space, its numerous game components might make your table look like a bit of a knockoff Jackson Pollock. That physically hurt me. I, I need to tidy this up right now. <laughs> if you are unsure about space, then maybe start with these. Skull is an all-time favourite of mine. You can actually play this with a deck of cards, but if you were like me and love the look of these beautiful coasters, then I highly recommend this box illustrated by Tom Burchett. I've taken this to the pub and we still have space on the table for uh, uh, numerous rounds. And also The Fox in the Forest, a great two-player trick-taking card game that I've even been able to play on the train. And Just Like Skull features some absolutely beautiful artwork. <laughs> can be a really easy, however sometimes dangerous way to get into tabletop gaming. For example, there are some absolutely brilliant and hugely successful games that come from massive franchises like Lord of the Rings, Star Wars, Marvel, Lovecraftian horror, classic themes like sci-fi and fantasy, and even historical events like World War II. However, Sometimes a theme is just slapped onto a game for sales that doesn't actually have, well, a solid game. Two games that I was so, so excited for and thought would be brilliant was The Witcher and the Fallout board game. But both just left me feeling really underwhelmed. And these were franchises that gave me some of my fondest gaming memories. Games on my favourite list that have easily recognisable themes would be Arabian Nights, which is a great storytelling game set in the wondrous, enchanting and dangerous world of infamous heroes like Aladdin and Sinbad. Star Wars Rebellion, a perfect head-to-head -head game for all fans of the original trilogy who want to live out the story their own way as either the Empire or Rebels. If you are a superhero fan, then Marvel Champions card game that plays similarly to the Lord of the Rings Living card game or the Marvel Crisis Protocol miniature game might just be for you. Do you like things that go bump in the night? Then the critically acclaimed Arkham Horror Living card game is a must. Or also from Fantasy Flight Games Eldritch Horror, which is also set in the unforgiving, horrifying Lovecraftian universe. However, just keep in mind that a theme that you are passionate about might not be for everyone. For example, I adore the dog fighting, missile firing, stress induced pilot controlled ships of X Wing. However, my wife just doesn't have time for it. She appreciates the mechanics and can see that it's a really tightly designed game. However, she doesn't have the connection to the source material that I do. So all she's looking at is a pile of plastic on a nicely printed board. However, put the very similar Marvel Crisis Protocol in front of her and we can play game after game after game. Give me a rule book thicker than the yellow pages, a good cup of tea, 
some great tunes, and that is the makings of a banging Friday night. But then again, not everyone is up for complex rules that might take hours to learn. Now, there's gamers like me who thrive and seek the complexity of games like Eldritch Horror and Nemesis, but that might have beginners with their hands in their heads as dice are rolled for varying phases and cards are passed back and forth for some reason. But it's understandable why well, gamers like me enjoy that because we are so past the randomness of a single dice roll in games like Monopoly and Snakes and Ladders where really you have no tactics but luck. But that shouldn't mean that you need some sort of PhD to sit down and enjoy a board game. A great game that is not only simple to learn, but will have you and all the other players sitting at the edge of their seat is the Tour de France cycling extravaganza Flamme Rouge. Honestly, this game is award winning for a reason and it is one of my personal favourites. I've also already mentioned them, but if you can count to a hundred, then certainly buy The Mind and the Mind Extreme. This ties into both theme and the complexity of the rules. Back when I first introduced my wife to the hobby, there is no way I could put a game like Gloomhaven in front of her. Sure, now it is so simple that Neither of us have to worry if she's levelled up her character correctly or has she got the right amount of hands for the type of class she's playing or what element is waning or full power and what status effect does what. But back at the start, it was much more important that I had a game that I know I could teach her quickly to keep her interested, possibly not even have a theme or recognisable franchise because I didn't want that to put her off. And also it had to be something we could play again and again and again. And this is where games like Flux, The Mind, Codenames, and eventually Quax, Flam Rouge, and Mysterium all really flourish. They're not just brilliant games, but they're easy to teach and you'll have great laughs again and again. And to be honest, these few games are still probably the ones that I would use to this day to introduce people to the hobby. I am now a dad, and although yes, my daughter is probably a little bit too young to be playing games at the minute, I'm already thinking about games that we could play as a whole family. And that includes you, Grandma and Papa. Does that sound good? Does that sound good? Yeah! <laughs> Bunny Kingdom is a fantastic area control game that will see you taking over fiefdoms with simply a card reveal. And yes, it can be highly tactical with its expansion, Bunny Kingdom in the Sky, and if you're a bit more of an experienced player. However, the mechanics are so, so simple to teach, and the artwork is so friendly and really, really cute and cuddly, you kind of can't go wrong with it. The Quacks of Quedlinburg is an absolutely fantastic game for the whole family. It will see you dealing with counting, colour recognition, patterns, and the rules are so, so simple to teach. Better yet, it is an absolute cauldron of laughs when sadly someone's potion explodes. Another fantastic game is Codes Names. This will see you trying to pair words together that seemingly have no connection at all, making you think just that little bit outside the box. And if word games aren't really your vibe, well, Code Names pictures also exist. And if you want to be just that little bit more child friendly, there is a Disney version and Marvel edition. Now, if you like the mechanics of code names, but want to make things a little bit more interesting, then I suggest the sinister undertones of Mysterium, similar to that of games like Cluedo. And I am so, so pleased to say that the Kung Fu Panda board game is absolutely fantastic. Now, I know what you're thinking, but one, this is great for children because you can take the timer out, making this game just focus on teamwork, putting combos of dice together and eventually reaching the finish line together. But if you want to make it a challenge, 
add that timer in and oh my god is this game tough it even encourages you to start every round by saying Kung Fu! just like jack black i think that was a good jack black impression i'm not sure i really really recommend trying it if you can and finally my two absolute favorite the road to el dorado and the previously mentioned flam rouge both these games make snakes and ladders look like yesterday's jam what I mean by that is both these games are races to the finish line. However, rather than that random dice rolls, they use deck building. El Dorado will see you taking your explorers all the way to the City of Gold and Flam Rouge is an exciting race to the finish line for both your cyclists. If I was hosting a game night with a bunch of friends who I know love board games and can get hugely invested in whatever I put in front of them, then they likely won't mind if I faff about for 30 minutes setting up a game. And that is if I haven't already set it up. However, with playing games like Gloomhaven, Nemesis and Star Wars Legion, these can take hours, easily. And that's if we just play one game. It's very unlikely that we set up Gloomhaven just to play one mission. And that's just setting it up. Remember, you're also going to be packing it away. Even games like Quacks of Quedlinburg can take a ton of time once all those pieces are jumbled into each person's ingredient bag. And while storage solutions can speed up both setting up and packing away, Unless you want to be looking like me with Champions of Midgard, then I'd recommend starting your collection with maybe slightly smaller games with less components. Now here is an area of gaming that when I started this hobby, I really didn't think I'd be talking about. My experience of gaming were people huddled around a table like this, cards in hand, dice being rolled, and some sort of gigantic piece of cardboard between us. Little did I know that some of my favourite gaming memories would be played with maybe five to 20 people at a party, or even work. Party games have evolved so much and sometimes need very little, if any, components at all. Don't Get Got is a game that is far better than it has any right to be. And it's so hard to talk about without spoiling the many tasks that this game will get you to do. But if you like the idea of getting other players to do seemingly innocent things for points, then this game is hilarious. And I will be reviewing this little box very, very soon. Other great party games like One Night Werewolf, The Resistance and Mafia all pretty much share the same mechanic as each other and they might even remind you of childhood classic Wink Murder. But they all have their own unique setting, can be taught as quickly as the game box is opened and better yet, they can be played again, again and again. Oh, and here is something pretty lovely. An absolute classic party game, and probably even my favourite, is free online to download and print. Two Rooms in a Boom caters for much larger parties, and we'll see two teams pitted against each other. The Blues, who will be protecting their president, and the Reds, who will have a bomber. But do not expect everyone will be who they say they are. And if you want to support the creators, and for creating such a brilliant game, you really should. You can now buy a wonderful printed edition and expansion, which makes this game of intrigue harder and more exciting. Something that we are seeing more and more in the video game industry is that people are unhappy spending large amounts of money for a game that might only have a 10 hour campaign with little replay value. And I get it, if you buy a game, you want to be able to play it again and again. That is totally understandable. And board games can suffer from a similar issue. 
Okay, most board games you can play are plenty, but you are not likely going to take the same game out every week, but you'll probably play it a fair few times. Saying that, developers are aware that some people might actually want to take out some of their favourite games week after week. So, they develop expansions that might not only improve the game, but could add expansions that make their game even more interesting. Just take the Champions of Midgard, for example. Now, I love the base game of Midgard. It's competitive. I adore the Viking setting and it's really easy to teach. But if you take this out to the same group of players again and again, you'll likely start to fall into the same tactics just due to the limited amount of paths to take. The two absolutely brilliant expansions, however, allowed my wife and I to go head to head every night for a week. Now, this is due to the varying champions and their respective unique skills. These now influence the now increased paths that you can take to victory. But there are games that you might want to stay clear of. I have already talked about the investment into miniature games can be pricey, but it can also affect replayability. For example, the base games of Legion, X-Wing and Marvel Crisis Protocol all come with a good amount of miniatures. Some more than others. If you took any of these home, I'm sure you would get quite a few games until you felt you'd done every variation possible. However, except Marvel Crisis Protocol, none of these games actually come with enough miniatures, which their own rulebook says is the smallest army possible. Which means you are 100% encouraged to buy more and more miniatures. Now, when I bought the core box for Legion, I had already planned what miniatures that Fantasy Flight Games were releasing over the year that I would be buying. Now, a release schedule for buying miniatures is totally normal. However, these types of games normally encourage organised play. This means going to an event or tournament where you will take all your minis and battle it out. But I don't do tournaments because, to be honest, they're not really my thing. And I've always collected board games, so it's often me that hosts the game nights. Which means if we want to play a game like X-Wing, then I have to take out this, and this, and to be honest, more. And this is how we can set up our armies, and obviously check the rules at times. Now, I bought this. Nobody else. Do you see what I'm getting at? No, I love collecting every single playable side because I like all my armies to be equal. And by the way, this pales in comparison to what some collectors have. But if I didn't have this, then all of our games would become very similar and kind of affecting replayability. Now, I know this video might seem like I'm telling you to never buy a miniature game when really I'm not because I do think they're brilliant and they really are some of my favourite games up there. But I really do recommend trying them out at friends if you can before you start collecting for collecting's sake. If you are looking for games with huge replayability, then just look at the classics that reviewers like myself are still mentioning and are still topping the board game geek charts. There's a reason they are still there. Developers will have likely moved on from these games and the chance of expansions changing the game are low. And while games like Pandemic, Eldritch Horror, The Lord of the Rings and Arkham Horror Living Card Game do have absolutely loads of expansions, they are totally optional and can be added as you like. Now, another choice that might dent that wallet just a little bit more, but will have unquestionable replayability, is games that feature a campaign, or better yet, legacy games. Now, a campaign will see your gaming group come back to the table again and again, and it'll see your characters encountering just slightly harder tasks that might challenge you as a player. And the wonderful Flamme Rouge, you can actually play a tournament. That means the longer that you go on winning, the more fatigued your cyclists will become, and you'll have to start using different tactics to win. And I won't even touch on today just how 
terrifying and challenging the Nemesis campaign Untold Stories 1 and 2 that come in these beautiful graphic novels are, but wow, do they transform this already brilliant game. Now, legacy games like Gloomhaven or the very well-named Pandemic Legacy are basically one big, huge campaign. Games like Gloomhaven actually challenge the idea of replayability because the developers only want you to complete them once. Now, this is because certain cards in the game actually encourage you to destroy them once you encounter them. But you don't really have to worry because these games are so big and so long that you probably won't see the midway point for weeks or even months. Yeah. And if you're savvy, there are ways to easily make these campaigns replayable for other groups of players if you wish to pass them on as a gift. Maybe just don't rip up the cards. Personally, I bought the reusable sticker set for Gloomhaven for this very reason. It allowed me to reseal the envelopes and even restart the map. But honestly, I'm going to be framing this beauty when my wife and I complete this again, because it's, it's really pretty. <laughs> There are some great games out there that honestly don't have the best artwork or components, but I cannot help pick up a box with utterly stunning artwork. Honestly, I hadn't even read a review of Undaunted Normandy before I ordered it. Look at Roland McDonald's wonderful watercolour style artwork. Immediately, I knew that the creators cared about this game. When I opened it, I was even more impressed. When the art continues into how well packed the components are, you can tell you are in for a good ride. If you have ever glanced at the artwork for Inish, then you know exactly what I'm talking about. Now, it might sound crazy that I buy a game simply for the way it looks, but it makes me trust the developers for taking care and believing in their product. However, this can be like an exotic predator luring on its prey with its marvellous colours. You see, Kickstarter sees some absolutely amazing looking games published, but because of the huge investments they can receive from backers, these games can be more style than substance. I'd actually recommend looking at Shut Up and Sit Down's review of Batman Gotham City Chronicles, which suffers from exactly this problem. But not all of these beautiful games are just boxes full of plastic with no substance, because two of my all-time favourites actually started their life as Kickstarters. So I'd say play it safe and see if you can actually see any gameplay before you go and back the project, or you can go to look at the developer's history and see if they have had any other successful projects. Trick-taking games, living card games, legacy RPGs, worker placement, war games and deck builders are just a few of the types of games that you can find. And while these can be a great way of finding other games that play like the games you already know and love, personally I'd use some of the other pointers that I've mentioned before. <laughs> I've learned so much from visiting my local game store, Static Games, in Glasgow. And I love going to gaming cafes such as West End Games. Now, when I was on tour with a show, we would be in a different city every week, and I would love looking ahead and finding out the recommended game store in that city and going to check it out. And it was incredible. Like, all these guys knew their stuff, and they were always there to help. And not only that, they knew pretty much everything about every game they were selling, probably because they've played most of them. Now, when things get a bit back to normal, eventually, it's really important that we support these stores. Not just because they are a wealth of knowledge and you can learn so much, but you're also going to meet like-minded people and gamers. It's a win-win. If you want to see these games and more reviewed and their rules broken down, 
subscribe to flip the boards now and don't forget to turn on those notifications so you don't miss a thing if you would like to know more about flip the board then come on over to our website www.flipthebordreviews.com over there you can learn more about us our plans for the future and if you like you can pick up some pretty sweet merch. Now, before I go, I wanted to mention our absolutely wonderful sponsor for this video, The Beard and The Wonderful. Now, I first came across this company when I decided to grow out my beard. I did this because one, I have an absolute baby face and also because I had to be cleanly shaven for a job I was doing at Christmas. Now, this is the first time I grew out my beard and I decided to get some advice. And a lot of the recommended products that I was told about all had some sort of nut oil in them that would sadly affect my daughter's skin. So after a bit of research, how lucky I was to find the absolutely fantastic The Beard and The Wonderful. They not only have so many products to choose from, they are all allergen free. Now, if you would like to try them out yourself, you can use the code FLIPTHEBOARDS10 for 10% off their store. On their store, you will find so many fragrances to choose from in all of their oils, bams, and also mustache waxes. But for the non-bearded among you, you can also try their tattoo aftercare bam or their absolutely wonderful lip bam. Thank you for watching. Stay safe and keep gaming.